That's right, for once, I'm not reading Undertale. Uh, today I'm reading Parker's Theorem by Wind at Your Back, which is a Spider-Man No Way Home fic. It immediately follows the events of the movie, so if you haven't seen the movie, what are you doing? It's incredible. And don't listen to this until you've seen the movie. Um, it won't make any sense and it'll ruin the surprises. But anyway, I am dressed in <laughs> the closest thing I have <laughs> to Spider-Man's suit. Uh, it's still technically a Marvel reference, so I'm going to count it. It says Hail Pydra. See? Uh-huh. Get it? Get it? Get it? Ha ha ha. I also have a, a cover on this mic because I keep blowing into it. Whoops, I didn't even have it on. So, anyway. I'm gonna try my best to do the voices for the Spideys, but... We will see how that goes. Thank you so much to the author for giving me permission to dub their fic. I appreciate it, and I hope that I don't disappoint. Alright. Parker's Theorem by Wind at Your Back. Spoilers for Spider-Man No Way Home. Coming up. That's your final warning. The multiverse was fixed. The rifts between dimensions had been closed. And Peter Parker was alone. All it was meant to be. But then reality starts to tear apart once again. Strangers start appearing out of nowhere, dazed and aggressive. New York shifts and starts to change in appearance. Even the former Avengers Tower disappears for a moment, and Peter Parker's emotions are leading him into an abyss from which he may not be saved from. Interdimensional beings from outside time and space, a giant super collider threatening to collapse multiple realities, and the return of two Spidey brothers. The multiverse is breaking again, and it needs Spider-Man's help. For reference, uh... Peter 1 is Tom Holland, Peter 2 is Tobey Maguire, and Peter 3 is uh, Andrew Garfield. And God help me, I'm going to try to do different voices for all of them. <laughs> and we'll see how well it works. We'll see how well that, we'll see how well that goes. <laughs> how well I can do that. Good luck with me just doing even one, honestly. My God. Okay. Chapter 1. As I Live and Breathe. The glass window provided the only insight into what was dubbed the Collider Room, where her years of research had finally culminated into this, a bulking device on two opposite ends of an impossibly large chamber, almost simulating two colossal drills that sunk inside of itself, gaping black holes within each one. She leaned forward even further, gazing at a specific point in the middle of these machines, seemingly at thin air, but it wasn't to her. Her brown eyes widened as she pictured what could happen next. Would it even work? It had to. The circumstances were perfect. If it had not been for the occurrences months prior atop the Statue of Liberty, then this work might have only remained a mere pipe dream. But it was only through those circumstances that granted her the funds and support she needed, even if that sponsorship came from rich men she wouldn't really get along with. Ma'am? A voice called behind her. Coming back to herself, she craned her neck to see one of the leading scientists leading up from the desk he was working at, staring at her intently. We're ready for our first test, the man said. If you're ready, doctor... Oh, please, just call me Liv. We've known each other long enough, she replied, rolling her eyes. Her hands pressed onto the wheels of her wheelchair, and she pushed herself forward a little away from the window, then expertly spun around to face it again, except now sat directly horizontally from the project leader. All right, let's turn this thing on. Remember, folks, we're not tearing apart the multiverse. We just want to create a crack at the designated localized point. Whether it's temporary or permanent, it doesn't matter. We just want to do it. Lights in the colossal chamber ahead of them flashed to life, and the super collider hummed as it warmed up. Slowly, the mechanisms began to start rotating, one clockwise, the other anti-clockwise, and continued to spin until they became a blur. Halfway through warm-up, a voice called from the rear of the room. Identify the nearest dimension concurrent to your own, 
Another called from the far right. Be prepared for dimensional tethering. Identified, the leading scientist announced. Analysis? Estimated homogeneous percentage of concurrent dimensions rated at 63%, came a woman to the left of Liv. The dimensions are not similar enough. We could risk instability. We ought to identify neighboring universes rating at a higher percentage. We're more likely to risk instability the further apart the dimensions are, Liv stated irritably, waving a hand dismissively. It's better if they're next to each other rather than pulling any in that are far apart. Use the one we have. Super Collider at maximum output. Preparation. Generating power. The cores of the two colliders within the room begin to grow, uh, glow with tungsten light, and the control room quivered, as though in fright. Liv leaned forward in anticipation, eyes wide and reflecting the bright white lights from within. A powerful tremor shook the room just as a thick, fierce energy from the two colliders shot out from either end and slammed into each other. The two beams met and almost seemed to join together. Lashes of electrical and foreign energy whipped from the heart of the energized explosion. Particle collision complete! Increasing energy by 2% increments! Make it 5! Liv yelled. The energy grew brighter and brighter, and now the room was beginning to tremble at a consistent rate. Within the chamber ahead, one of the steel tiles on the wall suddenly flashed and sparked then loosened and tumbled onto the floor. Ten percent increments! Liv hollered excitedly. We're already pushing at a limit at five percent! The particle collision will become unstable at ten percent! We can't risk it! Wait! Something's happening! Within the core of the explosion, reality was beginning to tremble. Cracks began to form, as though someone had brought a hammer and smashed a layer of thick glass. White seams began to stretch and crawl across, like ice cracking and threatening to break apart. Then, with a great shudder, the cracks shimmered and split open by barely half an inch. It was surreal, like they were peering into a mirror that reflected something completely different back. Reality existed in front of it, and behind it, and yet... There was a tear in that impossibly thin stretch of space. She couldn't see anything. It was just pure, unadulterated space. We've breached into the other universe, a voice called out. It's a success! The shouts and whoops of celebration were deafened to Liv as she leaned forward. At some point, her excitement had drawn her to the window, and she was practically pressing her nose against the window. Then the control room lit up red. Alarms caterwauling, and the scientists flew into a flurry of panic and loud conversation. Liv broke out of her spell of amazement and spun round in her wheelchair. What's going on? she demanded. Something's coming through the gap, someone called. Something, something from the other side. We can't let it through, the scientist to Liv's left yelled. It could pull the seams on the rest of the cracks in the multiverse. We have to close it. There's a call from Manhattan base, someone else bellowed over the noise, waving a phone in the air. Cracks are appearing in the rest of New York. The seams are coming loose. We've got to shut this down, the leading scientist called. Liv felt her heart shudder in shock. No, she rasped, her face contorting into rage. Let's, let's hold it. We're about to have a breakthrough. If we keep it open, the seams will break open, the leading scientist snapped, leaning forward. Everything from their universe will fall into ours. Everything. People, creatures, buildings, reality itself will collapse into our universe. We're talking about the destruction of multiple universes. Liv hesitated, her bottom lip trembling. She didn't want to call it off so soon. All right, she whispered, then spun in her chair to address the room. Shut it down, now! The energy between the colliders slowly began to shrink into thin lines. The portal between the two universes slowly snapped shut, the cracks thinning into nothingness. Finally, the super collider powered down until the room was met with nothing but low murmurs and sighs of relief. Liv sat in front of the glass, once again staring into the space right in between where the collider's energy had smashed into each other. She had seen it. A space between two universes. Right in front of her was everything she had ever needed. 
It's a success, Doc. Uh, Liv, came the voice of the head scientist behind her. It was a success. We did something that had never been done before with science. We breached reality itself. We opened cracks between universes. From the corner of her vision, the man offered a champagne glass filled with... Oops, that was supposed to be a man. Sorry. It's a success, Doc. Uh, Liv, came the voice of the head scientist behind her. It was a success. We did something that had never been done before with science. We breached reality itself. We opened cracks between universes. From the corner of her vision, the man offered a champagne glass filled with a sour-looking liquid that fizzed merrily. She hesitated, then finally took it in her fingers and raised it to him. To our success, the man said, tipping the glass to her. Yeah, Liv replied. There was a cunning gleam in her eyes. To the success of Octavius Industries. Frick, what does Andrew Garfield sound like? But I carried on, tried to keep going, tried to be the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Because I know that's what she would have wanted, but... At some point, I stopped pulling my punches. I got rageful. I got bitter. I just don't want you to end up like... like me. I did not read that like Andrew Garfield said it. I'm sorry. I have been experimenting with trying to do their voices accurately. And I just can't. I'm gonna start putting up a picture of who I'm talking about <laughs> on top of me. When I edit this, you'll be able to you'll be able to tell that way. All right. He could still remember that feeling in his veins, that rage, that bitterness, that desire and anger for vengeance. Anger was easier to control than sadness. Sadness ate up inside of him, left him pathetic and tearful, but anger gave him purpose and strength. Some nights on those kind of nights where the radiator attempted to creak into life and his bedsheets seemed too thin to cover the worst of the cold, he wished that he could be angry. But Peter Parker wasn't angry anymore. He was just sad. The universe was vast and expansive, and even further beyond the impossibly ever-growing size of all of existence was even more existence. More universes that put the existence of Peter Parker into smaller than an atom in a universe. He was irrevocably tiny. But all within those universes... But all within these universes, there were truths and lies, paradoxes and impossibilities. There were facts. Things that could not happen, ever, even despite the vast expanse of all of existence... There were just concepts that could never, ever happen, because those were just the rules of the universe. The rules of mathematics or science, like how two mountains must always have a valley between them, or how two objects can never, ever be perfectly identical, for they would need to share the same matter and same space in time and space. They were absolute, irrevocable facts. Peter knew one of these truths. It was tiny just like him in this vast expanse of a universe. No, perhaps even in all the multiverses in the world. But it mattered to him. He called it Parker's Theorem, and it was a simple concept. Peter Parker could never, ever be happy. Tragedy and grief were common in life, and yet Peter felt he had gotten worse than just a short end of the stick. His parents were killed when he was just a very young boy, he had watched his Uncle Ben die in his arms. He had very little friends all throughout his life. He had watched Tony Stark perish after saving the world. And only mere months ago, he had watched his dearest Aunt May die and witness his dearest friends in the world, MJ and Ned, be forced to forget who he was in order to save the multiverse from being torn apart. All in the same night. Now, he was living on his own in some crappy apartment, navigating a world that no longer knew him, and therefore no longer needed him. He tried to convince himself, at first, that his apartment wasn't that bad. In truth, it really could have been a lot worse. The radiator usually worked, even if it took a long time to actually conjure any heat, so he'd have to turn it on three hours before it got too cold. 
The single light in the room might take a few seconds to actually turn on and was prone to randomly flickering and giving him headaches, but it worked. And the laundry machines on the ground floor might run on quarters and fill with water even after it finished a cycle, but his weird old lady neighbor who had five cats, despite it being against the contract to have pets, was nice enough to give him the quarters he needed. But it wasn't home. It wasn't his Aunt May's apartment. It wasn't the loft bed that would rattle when he climbed up on it. And it wasn't the windowsill with the scraped paint for each time he'd climb through. And it wasn't the kitchen that always seemed to be a little smoky from Aunt May's disaster recipes. Or the bedroom where Ned and Peter would build Lego sets together. Or that living room where he and MJ once studied debate together a long time ago. It wasn't home because they weren't here. Nobody was here. He was irrevocably alone. Peter did what he could to entertain himself and to keep a grasp on his sanity. Some days he felt as though he was forgetting who he was, with nothing and nobody around to confirm that he existed, that anything in his that anything in the past ever existed. On the wall above his bed was a collection of sticky notes, an array of yellows and pinks and blues, with notes and scribbles on each one, as well as thin pieces of string from his frayed curtains that had torn away from age to interconnect these notes. This was his Peter Wall. It consisted of his past, his present, and his idealized future. And yes, that's what the picture is. One half was everything that happened to him, acting as confirmation that he existed and exists, some were key memories implanted into his head forever. Getting bitten by a spider, Tony Stark first appearing in his living room, fighting Captain America, fighting Vulture, fighting all these villains with two other Peter Parkers by his side. God, he missed those two. A small section was his present, his now. His existence in this current time was... Well, there was a reason as to why this section on his wall was so tiny. There was nothing entertaining about being Peter Parker. He was studying hard for his GED, he worked as a pizza delivery boy for a boss that seemed always on the edge of shouting at him, he had notes of when rent was due and what bills he was behind on, a big sticky note that reminded him to get coffee on Sunday mornings in the donut shop MJ worked at, always to take away. But nothing of importance. Nothing. It was just existence. Just some proof that he was real right now. It was there to ground him. Nothing more. And then the rest was taken up with his future, or his idea of the future Peter Parker he would like to be. There were ideas of going to a local college. MIT seemed completely off the table. It had such an impossibly low acceptance rate anyway. And it was shrank even lower as a high school dropout, even with the evidence of a stark internship that he had managed to scrape together. There was always Queensboro Community College. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking another run at that. There was always Queensboro Community College. Or, if he was really lucky, he could get into Empire State University. There were ideas of what kind of jobs he'd want, mostly in biochemistry or in bioengineering and even threw in the possibility of picking up teaching at Midtown High. There were other sticky notes, haphazardly slapped on, some with more slanted and messy handwriting than others, all with extremely short messages scribbled on. Be more kind. Be responsible. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. Be more optimistic. Smile more. Haphazardly written advice that was haphazardly followed. Peter wasn't angry or bitter, but he sure as hell was not smiling more, either. If it wasn't for his vigilantism for being Spider-Man, then he genuinely would have opted to say that he would have almost nothing to live for. Whenever he got off work or had finished studying for the day, he was wriggling into his new spandex suit that he had sewn himself and leaping out the window. A new life meant a new suit, and it at least provided a distraction from solitude to try to develop his own suit, but he couldn't help but confess that it was the suits of the other Spider-Men he had met from alternate universes that had inspired him the most. They had been independent in their Spider-Man experience from the start, 
No Stark technology, no nanotech, no Doctor Strange magic. It had all been homemade sewing and sketchbook ideas to create the real friendly neighborhood Spider-Man look. They were better Spider-Men than he was. Better than he ever could be, but he at least ha he had to at least try. He would try. He was trying. Every single day, he was trying. Some days, it was easier, but most days, it was so difficult that he might let himself free-fall in the air for longer than he ought to, briefly envision himself as a bloodied mess of bones on hard concrete, then swing. Peter III, the younger one of the pair, with fluffy brown hair and an awkward sense of humor, had called them brothers. He said he loved him. He had only nodded in response back then, but Peter sometimes wished he could go back and say it back. He was trying. It snowed exactly a week before Christmas Day in New York. Tiny white baubles of snowflakes fluttered down onto the streets of the Big Apple, leaving a soft strip of snow on the roads and the rooftops. It was unclear if it would become nothing but frost and water by the morning for now, but what was clear was the bitter chill that seeped through the streets and turned into drafts through the cheaper apartments in Midtown. Peter was trudging home that evening, bundled up in the thickest jacket he could and arms curled around his waist for means of warmth. His cheeks were glowing pink and he would occasionally blow out a warm breath and watch the wispy fog escape between his lips and disappear into nothing. He hated working in the cold. The truck he usually delivered pizzas in was out for repairs, so he had to use his own wages to rent a bicycle for the day just to get the food out in time. 25 minute delivery or you get your money back, Peter growled under his breath, scathingly. Stupidest idea ever. They even try to time me. At least make it an extra 15 minutes in the winter. It's harder to bike in the snow. His apartment was not much warmer than the outside. He didn't want to call it home just yet, but it, because it wasn't Aunt May's apartment, but it was slowly growing to become something that could resemble a home. The sticky notes helped, but so did the makeshift lab made from equipment he smuggled out of Midtown High where he could make his web fluid. It wasn't stealing if he left some money behind, was it? And his desk was a mess of paperwork and books for his GED. He kicked the radiator to life so he wouldn't freeze to death after he slept, threw off his clothes, and began to wriggle into his homemade suit. New life, new suit. If you asked Peter to his face, he'd say that he just wanted a bit more of that friendly neighborhood Spider-Man feeling to it. But the truth was that he had been inspired by his other universe counterparts to design something new. No Stark technology, no special fabricators or nanotechnology. He wanted something humble. The other Spider-Men were exactly what he wanted to be, and he thought he could at least start by replicating the vibe of their own homemade costumes. Patrol was eventful. It seemed as though crime was escalating into rampant levels, even for New York at Christmas time. As soon as he was done dealing with one situation, he was dashing off to deal with another. As he patrolled and fought, things seemed a little off. A lot of the criminals seemed extremely confused, falling into fits of uncontrollable anger that would result in aggression against anyone in the vicinity. Sometimes Peter would go back the way he came and pass by a crime scene, only to find that the webbed-up criminal he had dealt with mere minutes ago had mysteriously vanished. They hadn't even broken out of the webs that pinned them onto walls or floors. It was as though they had just dropped out of existence. Even Peter was having episodes of confusion. Sometimes, he'd turn a corner and feel a tingling pain all up his body, only to vanish as soon as it had come. Often after these tingles, he'd turn a corner and find New York looking a little different than he recalled. Usually it was small things, like a deli suddenly becoming a McDonald's, or an apartment block having much nicer bricks than it did just a moment ago. But tonight? He had experienced a flash of pain in his whole body that seemed worse than usual, spun around, and saw the former Avengers Tower had mysteriously vanished from the horizon of Manhattan. The fuck? 
He managed to spit until another tingle of pain crawled up his skin, painful enough to cause him to wobble on his web and drop down into a heap onto the rooftop of a nearby building. Scrambling onto his knees, he looked back up to see the refurbished Avengers Tower back on the horizon. Peter sat on his knees for a moment, gazing at the glass building stupidly for a moment before blinking and getting to his feet. Seeing things, he muttered to himself, shaking his head. Need to eat more. Stupid. He hopped off the roof, letting himself freefall for a period that was enough to give anybody the shivers until he released a web and swung. The tips of his toes scraped against the concrete road on Manhattan, and he responded by pulling himself forward with two webs, thrusting himself forward into the air. He launched upward, spinning slightly, then bounced off a large neon sign jutting outward and gained even more air. Noises caught his ears and his head whipped round. Bursting out of a fire exit on a rooftop, a group of thugs stumbled out of the narrow passageway. They were each dressed in black, caps hanging low over their head and mufflers covering the lower portion of their face. The four of them seemed shocked for a moment, then turned suddenly and broke out into a ferocious brawl. Peter swung into action, sensing a tent. Peter swung into action, sending a tense string of web onto a nearby building and hurtling towards them, feet first. His feet collided right into the heads of one of the thugs, sending one of them toppling over onto the ground, half conscious, and providing Spider-Man a perfect three-point landing pose. Hope I'm not late to the party. He called out. The three thugs spun around blindly, all of them sporting some kind of injury from broken noses to freshly swelling black eyes, and snarled at the appearance of none other than Spider-Man. Seemingly ignoring the fact that they had been at each other's throats only a moment before, they dived to attack. Peter instantly leapt, flipping right over their heads and aiming a precise web at the back of one of the thugs' heads. He landed and swung the web towards him, causing the thug to slip and smash the back of his head right into the concrete. Whoops! He joked, weaving and ducking as the pair still standing began to throw punch after punch at him. One at a time now, I'll get you both! Your new costume looks like shit, Spider-Man! One of them snarled. In a crazed fit, the thug leapt forward in an attempt to seize Peter by the throat. But Peter almost lazily hopped out of the way. Really? I thought it brings out my eyes, Peter replied, catching a punch in his hand and twisting the thug's arm until he heard bones begin to crack and snap. The thug yelled in pain and Peter kicked the man in the face, sending him sprawling to the ground. His spider sense went off, but he barely had time to register the punch that caught him square around the jaw. He dropped prone for a moment, but quickly rolled backwards and sprung onto his feet again. To his shock, he could feel blood already starting to leak out of the corner of his mouth. Peter could take a punch easily from a normal thug like this, but to bleed out like this? Not to mention for a hit to almost bypass his tingles. Nice hit! Better savor it! You won't get another one! Peter remarked. One thug left to go. He ducked, avoiding another punch, and threw a punch that was meant to knock out the last one, but instead, he met resistance, only causing them to stumble and blink in surprise. You'll have to try harder than that, Spider-Man, the man retorted, grinning. I've caught a few hits off you before. Been dodging them for over a decade after all. Peter froze. <laughs> Peter, <laughs> sorry. Peter felt a tingle go down his spine, and he froze just so briefly. A decade? That wasn't possible. Ignoring the time span of him being dusted, he had only been Spider-Man for around three years. Where the hell did a decade come from? His opponent had apparently taken in the opportunity of Peter pausing, and that brief moment of Peter's guard being taken down paid off. The thug charged and threw his entire body weight into Peter. Suddenly they were wrestling midair and falling, falling. His body slammed into concrete just as he had vaguely imagined it so many times over the past weeks. But he was not dead. Instead, he felt pain blossoming in his back, in his arms and legs, spreading out and throbbing painfully. Spitting out blood, Peter groaned and scrambled onto his knees. 
Alarmed at the well-being of his opponent, he rolled over and saw the lone thug struggling to his knees. Peter's jaw fell open. Nobody but someone superhuman like him should have survived that fall without breaking a few limbs. Yet, the man was already getting to his feet, albeit shakily, heaving out deep, heavy breaths. Who... who are you? Peter groaned, trying to get to his knees. The man leapt forward, aiming a kick and slamming his shoes into Peter's chest. With a cry of pain, Peter fell back onto the ground. Another well-aimed kick smacked him directly in the face, causing more blood to spray from his nose and out of his mouth. Pain throbbed through his whole body, and a feeling of relief washed over him. Somehow, feeling the aching protesting of his limbs and muscles and his own blood leak down his face and over his chin... It was oddly liberating, like it was physical evidence he existed, that he was alive. A strong grip seized the top of his mask, apparently attempting to wrench it off his face. Peter looked with blurred vision and saw the man's face, wrinkled, grinning eyes wide and teeth bared. Norman Osborne was grinning up at him. Someone was screaming, a deep, guttural scream of pure rage and fury, and it was only until he felt a raw, burning feeling in his throat that he realized it was him. It was like his body moved of his own accord, and he was watching from the sidelines, somewhere far away, as Peter began to throw punch after punch, beating the man senseless, feeling knuckle upon bone, upon flesh, punching over and over and over and over, blood spitting everywhere, all of his fists and his suit. It wasn't his blood, but it was his screaming, his roars of anger. Then the man collapsed to the ground, spinning slightly with a final knockout punch. Peter inhaled and felt himself coming back to his senses, his limbs and muscles quivering from the adrenaline pulsing through his veins. The man lying before him wasn't Norman Osborne at all. It didn't even look like him. I stopped pulling my punches. I got rageful. I got bitter. Peter Three's voice swam in his head and the anger was slowly replacing with bitter sadness and self-loathing. With his heart still pulsing in his throat, Peter choked and turned away. I just don't want you to end up like me. No. The other Peter was wrong. He, Peter, wasn't becoming like him. He was becoming worse. All right, that's the end of chapter one. Kind of a bummer chapter, so I'm going to show you guys just to uh, promise you that this does actually turn into a really heartwarming fic. Uh, here's the summary for next chapter. So, we're gonna see some stuff. <laughs> that sounds so ominous. Uh, anyway, there you go. Stay tuned. If anybody wants to draw art for this fic, I'd uh, love to have it. I'll put it in the videos. So, hit me up. Bye.